So it is four o'clock. Welcome everyone. Welcome to Think Tank Europa's webinar on the upcoming election in Spain, due to take place on the 23rd of July in a, a month from now, so to speak. But uh, a lot can still happen between then and now. Even then, for the next 45 minutes, we'll try to outline the most critical questions to follow over, the, over this coming month. And of course, it's also just a great opportunity to stay stuck of, uh, of Spanish politics. And uh, with us to put it all into the right perspective, we have Jose Ignacio Torreblanca calling in today from southern Spain. You could say that you have one foot in Spain and another in Europe uh, because you are a senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations and uh, all the way since 2007, also head of the ECSR's office in Spain. And in addition to that, you are a professor of political science at the UNED University in Madrid. And you have had one year as an exchange student in Denmark many years ago. A, a warm welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Mange tak, Rasmus, og mange tak til alle sammen. Jeg er meget glad at være her i dag. Altså, så Rasmus uh, har fortalt, at uh, jeg, jeg boede i Danmark i 87. Altså, jeg er virkelig student. I, jeg gik på gymnasium i Hillerød. Men det er lang tid siden, og jeg har glemt det mest uh, altså med dansk. Så uh, jeg må gå i engelsk nu. Så so, thank you so much for the, for the invitation. I'm happy, very happy to be here and share with you my, my, my thoughts about Spain and the, and the elections. Ja, yeah, det vil i hvert fald være ambitiøst at tale om spansk politik på dansk, så vi holder det på engelsk. Um, we have, and we also have some English speaking guests, so uh, for the sake of them too. My name is Rasmus Fuss, and I encourage you all to put questions for uh, Jose in the chat, and then we'll make sure to include them uh, as we go along. But first, let's start with the regional elections, because the election, the national elections, was not even supposed to take place before the end of this year. Uh, then we had re regional elections that led Prime Minister Sanchez to call an early vote. Um, the reason was last month the left-wing parties who are in government, the centre-left PSOE and the further-left Podemos, uh, suffered a heavy defeat in several regions that have traditionally vote voted for, for the socialists. And going forward, now the centre-right party, uh, PP, will govern with the support of Vox, on the right wing in many parts of Spain. So, Jose, how would you explain or how do you interpret the outcome of, of the regional elections and, and why did the Pedro Sanchez call an early election immediately after? Okay, thank you so much. Happy to try and, 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 and shed some light on, on, on this. Um, I, mean, I think it was a combination, I would say, of four factors. The first factor was that um, Ciudadanos, which is uh, the party, that was created and was very successful around 2014 in order to dispute the center of the political scene, but also coming from Catalonia, trying to uh, to counter uh, the separatist movement in Catalonia, has disappeared. It's completely gone. And this party was uh, very strong, and most of its seats have gone to Partido Popular. So Partido Popular has benefited just by default of the existence of the disappearance of a major political party, which at some point it was even third in polls, it was first in Catalonia, and which had some high probabilities of, um, of being their partners. So in that, the centre-right is, is now not fully unified because it is still PP and Vox, but at least it's not competing in three brands. And in a municipal elections, when you run in three brands, because usually the mayor is the most voted, if there's no agreement, you know, if is the most voted candidate, you know, this is why the socialists uh, have done so well in the past uh, regional elections, because the, um, the right was split in three. Then this was one factor. The second factor was um, the division of the left at the left of the socialist party. You know, there are there is a movement which has now consolidated, which is called SUMAR, which is bringing no less than 14 parties which were scattered in different regions of, of Spain, all with very similar agendas, but they're, but until now, therefore, uh, unable to unite. And they were disputing United, Unidas Podemos or Podemos power. 
um, at this point in the regional elections, the, the, the coalition among them was not formed, was not clear, they were still uh, reveling. Podemos thought that they had the upper hand uh, because they were strong and the other ones had never been tested in, a, in an election. So therefore they didn't reach an agreement for, to a coalition. And that meant that with an electoral threshold of, of 5% in many places, in some of these places, you know, they, they wasted a lot of votes. You know, because even having like 9% of the vote, which could have been decisive in order to till the balance towards the socialists, these, these votes went wasted. And, the, and we will see whether to this extent this factor will stay on for, for the July election, but this was for sure something we played um, against, uh, against the left wing and the socialists. And then the, the other factor was that um, a lot of socialist voters as it is the case with parties who've been in government, and this is the case since 2018, use these kind of elections as a primary election to signal the, their discomfort or to punish those who, who are the incumbent at, uh, at the moment. So, you know, you, we have estimates of approximately 1 million socialist voters either staying home or partially, but very limitedly, uh, in a very limited way, moving to the, to the conservative. So, the demobilization of socialist voters was another factor in, in helping uh, the conservatives make the result. And the final one, I think it was a strategic mistake by, by Sanchez and the socialists who uh, totally accepted and bought in the, the campaign framework of Alberto Núñez Feijó, the new leader of the conservatives, who really needed this to be a midterm primary election or a midterm presidential election in order to boost his um, uh, his role and to make sure that he would be in a good position to contend for the for the what we thought were elections to be called in in December. So uh, Sanchez Nunez Pejo turned this into a plebiscite into me or Sanchez, and that worked pretty well because lots of mayors and regional leaders who had done well in terms of their public policies, who had high approval rates, then lost in this battle because this was turned into a nationwide election. And this is connected to why Sanchez decided to call an early election, because he waited so much in, he stepped so heavily into the election that many of these regional leaders who've lost their jobs um, would have, in theory, or were, you know, were to revolt against Sanchez by saying, you know, you, 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 you really spoiled this, you wrecked us all, and now, you know, we want you to at least to run things in a different way in the in the run up to the next general election. So Sanchez, uh, as he's been doing in the past, out of every crisis, you know, he steps out very fast in kind of a very audacious way. Um, so he decided on his own, without consulting the party, without calling the parliamentary group in, he decided to call for this early election. And in that way, he quashed any possibility of a revolt inside the party because you don't dispute leadership to a leader who is on, a, who on an election campaign and who's already the government, you know, in, in, in government. Mm. Yeah, and, and it, would, it would seem that we have quite different political dynamics than for the regional election. For example, we do have the, the left-wing coalition with Podemos inside of a SUMA, right? So what, what do you think we should expect from, from the elections on the 23rd of July? And if... Okay. The right wing prevails as the polls uh, predict at this point. What kind of government is likely to be formed? Uh, okay, so let's look. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Let's look at these four factors that I have outlined. How well or bad they will play once you replay them again in the next elections. So, so as for the disappearance of Ciudadanos, that's given. That's already there. Is going to benefit uh, the Conservative Party. Um, as for the division of the left, as you said, now there is a coalition between SUMAR and, and, and Unidas Podemos, which is going to make it a bit more difficult for the conservatives to at least benefit for this effect of votes being wasted or spilled um, during the campaign. And uh, the big challenge now is for the socialists to find out, one, whether, of course, this cannot uh, be other thing that a, that, a, that a referendum or a plebiscite or a, an election on Sanchez. Uh, it's now not possible not to run this on, a, on, on, on Sanchez. Let's see to which extent um, it is the brand, is the socialist, or it is Sanchez who is the problem for the socialist. And in that, when we look at polls, we see that a majority of voters in Spain are more or less happy 
with the with the policies uh, compared to the 2008 and 2010 11 financial crisis uh, there hasn't been massive layouts minimum salary has been increased um, there has been protection of workers and eviction so this is not the drama this i mean the covid and the post covid crisis has not been the social drama which it was in 2011 which led to the appearance of all these populist parties um, and, and to a great disruption in the political system. So, and then for most, you know, people are happy. Pensions have been also indexed to inflation and so on. So, you know, the government is pretty puzzled because they don't quite understand why is it that with the economy going well, unemployment being in historic low compared to Spanish standards and especially after COVID, um, energy prices have been contained in Spain to a larger extent that, um, than in the rest of Europe. Still, something doesn't work. What is it that it doesn't work? Is it Sanchez himself? Because, you know, in order to make government in 2019, he went too far left and too far uh, in coalition with um, um, pro-independence parties in Catalonia on, on, on the Basque country. Um, so this is this is a question on how that's. But, you know, if, if we look at the slides that I prepare, I can show you some of the trends which would uh, allow us to to understand um, you know, where are we and what are the chances that uh, that things go one way or the other? So so please load the uh, the presentation so I so we can go if, even briefly through um, those slides. Perfect. They are on their way on. And then, uh, yeah, let's talk about the expectations for, for what will happen. And the, again, the likely coalitions that might uh, form after. Yeah. OK, so, you know, if um, if you look, yeah, let's move to the um, to the to the next slide. Uh, this is what we have at the, you know, this is how the parliament is set up at the moment after the elections in, in November 2019. Uh, you see, you know, to the left, uh, the socialists are 120, PP is at uh, 89, Vox is at 52, which is a, a big factor now that we have to, we, that I want to discuss also with you, to which extent uh, um, Feijó will be able to tame or to reduce Vox influence. And then you have all these parties to which is Unidas Podemos at 35. So, you know, the parliament picks up uh, um, 350 seats. You need 176 to get an absolute majority in the first round. But then you can do uh, with a simple majority in the second in the second round, right? Okay, so let's go to the, um, to the so you see 28% for the socialists and 21% for the PP. That was the result in 2019. Let's move to the to the next slide, please. So, you know, this is the evolution of Spanish politics, a long cycle since 2014. If you look to the left, you see the years after 2011 in which um, the um, the Conservative Party in blue was well above um, the socialists with a peak uh, that you will see um, in 2011 when, when they got the absolute majority. And then you see a huge decline the rise of Ciudadanos uh, uh, and the rise of Podemos and so on. Uh, but remember that when you go to, um, you know, to, to the election in 2019, we were discussing you know, numbers were 28 and 21 for the socialists and the, and the conservatives. Let's do a snapshot, which is in the next slide, of what we are right now uh, in terms of the average pollings. OK, what you see here is that it is already for two years on that the conservatives and you see this is here in the middle of the table it is already for two years on that the conservatives are ahead the socialists except for this d which is their change of leadership so briefly when they changed from casado to feijo you know they lost kind of uh, because this was done in a very disorderly way and problematic but other than that you see that the political cycle in spain did already change in favor of the conservatives already two years ago. So the question for the next election is not who is going to win the election. Uh, we see only these trends consolidating. It is quite evident in all polls that the conservatives will win the election. The question is whether they will be able to form a government and whom will they be able to do it with. And this is where, where, where the problems start, you know, because this has to do with our electoral system. So in order to know why it is so difficult to make a prediction, you know, on whether the conservatives and Vox, they will need 176 votes or very close to that 
in order to make a government because they will very likely face a negative coalition of all the other parties against them with few exceptions. You know, Spain is a country which is traditionally kind of center left with nationalists which are progressive and because of territorial issues they prefer to vote for the socialists because even if they are right wing like a PNE, PNV in the in the Basque country they trust more the socialists in order to obtain uh, uh, competences and, and, and to, to form government and to support their policies in the territories with the socialists than with the conservatives. So the options for agreement with for the conservatives are limited mostly to Vox and almost only to Vox, but uh, you know, Vox would want to have a, high, a very high price uh, for that. Whereas for the socialists, you know, they can they can put together coalitions involving as I say, the left, but also regional parties. The problem at this point is that it is going to be a very tight election with um, the Conservatives and Vox being around 176, which will automatically mean that the Socialists cannot make an alternative government if they, if they are the second political force. But also that will create a lot of problems for Feijo because they will have to include Vox then they're now kind of playing a kind of a chicken game with with Vox. Like either you give me your support for free in the elections, or we will we will have to call for a for another election. So you will have you will bear the responsibility of the socialist staying in power. So they're kind of playing chicken. You know, Vox wants to be in government. PP will by all means not want them in government. They would just want their support on day one, and then try to to rule and to govern a flexible coalition. But one of the keys to this, if we go to the next slide, uh, which maybe uh, will help, is how uh, the, the Spanish electoral system works. So we say that we don't have a, a national election. We have 52 elections, which is the number of districts that we have. And you see the numbers of MPs that are elected in each district and there are huge differences so you know in the center you see madrid this is 37 seats where the system is mostly proportional right so we use don't system like in denmark though our formula is one four seven ten uh so the system in big cities like madrid you know third is 37 barcelona you see there to the right is 32 valencia is 15 seville is 12 you know, in these cities, the system is very proportional. So it doesn't matter whether there are four, five, or six parties in competition. What happens when you go to the majority of seats, which is a, well, not the majority, but around 120 seats in parliament, they are picked up in provinces which have very slow, very, very small number of MPs. Typically, some of them have three, some of them have five, four, as you can see, um, and, and six. What happens in these provinces is that the system doesn't work proportionally. It works to work with a tendency to be majoritarian, which means that three parties can get a seat, but it's very difficult for the fourth party to get one seat. So maybe you would have two seats for the PP, one seat for the socialists, one seat for the next one. That next one, it's key, because that next one can be either Vox or Sumar. And that can be by a handful of votes. It can go one end or it can go the other when you uh, when you do the numbers uh, and both, you know, and, and so there is a safety zone for parties, which is above 15, 16 percent of the vote, which will guarantee you the fourth or the fifth vote in provinces with three is practically two, one. But when you move into these provinces of uh, five, four, you can get the, you can get into, but you need to be above 16 percent. And Vox and Sumar are going to be disputing this. So a lot of things can happen uh, precisely because of this last seat in many of these uh, provinces, which can go wildly from, from the far left to the far right, but just one vote, right? Um, and and that, that is going to be key. And this is why we say that, of course, you know, elections are always difficult to predict. Fortunately, in democracies, we don't know who's going to win. You know, you don't want to win. You don't want to live in a country in which you know who's going to win the next election. You know, this happens in some countries, as we know, and, and it doesn't look good. But it's extraordinarily difficult on that. Then what can happen after the we can go. To, I think I think we can. Let me see the next slide just in case I forget um, something. Yeah, we we've seen a boost 
of um, confidence, kind of a, 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 a bandwagon effect on the PP after the regional election. So as, as you saw also in the previous trend, we saw that the PP was doing better after the elections because they hold all of a sudden started looking like a leader. So you had this improvement that you see of the PP of 3.5 uh, points and the socialists were doing worse after the election. Now this trend has been a bit corrected and both parties, both the socialists and the PP are on a rise. So the margin, it's not as, as huge as it, it should be for Feijó to win um, a comfortable uh, victory. So we can stop the presentation here if you, if you want. Okay. Uh, with the conclusion that, you know, we, as I said, if the numbers um, are confirmed, the numbers with which we're working, you could expect uh, one scenario in which with current numbers, PP and Vox, they do manage to get more than 176, but then you will have this kind of chicken game of whether you enter government or not. And there's big uncertainty about this because as a result of the regional and municipal elections, the decisions which PP leaders have been taking all around the country are totally asymmetric, and ad hoc and case by case basis. In Valencia, they took like 24 hours to sign an agreement with Vox uh, and get them into government as vice presidents and then approve kind of uh, some of very crazy declarations on climate change and the usual thing on gender and so on. But yesterday in Extremadura, the leader of the conservatives said that there was no way she was going to get into government people who were climate change deniers and gender violence deniers, you know, and this is the same party in two different regions. And in some other country, in also some other regions like Aragon, they're kind of a negotiators to try to work around a program and so on. So Feijó has suffered a heavy damage by the agreement in Valencia. And now is kind of expecting to get the benefits of kind of doing the cordon sanitaire mm. uh, in Extremadura. But people don't quite understand what is the model and what is the policy that PP has against Vox. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. It was a very good uh, background information. Uh, so it, it sounds like it's, it's, it may not even be the last national election in Spain this year. But if, if we look on the longer term, in one aspect, this is, this is as you say, a story of uh, a, Euro, a turn to the right or and a case where a center right uh, wing party will have to collaborate or consider uh, collaborating with a party to the uh, further to the right, right? And in, in recent elections, we've seen also right-wing parties win in, in Italy, in Sweden, Finland. They have a, a strong polling in Germany as well as in France. Would, would you, how, how do you think this uh, Spanish election fits into the story of a larger European turn to the right? And, and even if it does, if you would include Spain in that story, how would you say the Spanish case um, differs? From similar cases in Europe that that we that we know. Well, it's it's true that we see this trend uh, all across Europe. That the next um, European elections are going for sure be a confirmation of this. Um, it's paradoxical that uh, we thought at the beginning that uh, of the financial crisis that socialists and the social democrats had been the main victims of uh, uh, of the crisis, and therefore you saw in France and in Italy, in Greece. Socialist Party disappearance altogether, right? Uh, and and you only have by now stronger uh, social democratic uh, parties. Uh, I mean, in main uh, member states like in Spain and and, and in Germany. Uh, though you know, Spain is a bit of an exception because it's probably one of the last uh, large EU countries which still has both uh, socialists and conservatives. Because as, as I was saying, you know, in many other parties, traditional center-right countries, traditional center-right parties have also disappeared. Like, like in Italy, of course, and in France, you know, you don't know exactly. So, so it's true that uh, all across Europe, the right has moved to the, to the right. The electorate has also moved to the right. But I think it's Spain, even if it's along that line as well, um, it, it has not, uh, it's not doing it with such a radically, um, with such a depth and, and with such an intensity. Because when you put together the votes of um, the socialist Sumar and the regional parties, 
you practically see a country which is more or less split in, in half with PP and Vox on the one hand. And then because of this effect of regional parties, some of them are right wing, as I said, you know, but they would rather be in government with the socialists because the territorial uh, issue. The question here is what is Vox, you know, and how is it going to behave and 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 how to deal with them best. And, and, and the conservatives have kind of tried everything and, and it has worked in different ways. For example, in Madrid, it's very revealing because this is the capital of the country. This is where the hardcore Vox supporters are. But the PP has been able to field uh, a leader, Isabel Diaz Ayuso, who has kind of adopted some of the language of uh, Vox voters uh, and that therefore has managed to, um, to isolate them. So she managed to get an absolute majority and Vox is marginal in Madrid, which is very damaging for Vox, you know, because you are kind of an ultra-nationalist party. How cannot you be important in the capital of, 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 of the country, right? So, so in Madrid has worked. Uh, this has worked pretty well. Uh, Feijó has so far tried to kind of ignore them, not to not to either confront their leaders or not not to try even to seduce their voters by kind of importing their ideas. He has just bet on uh, voters are going to be rational at the end of the day. Uh, Vox was a party which was anti-Sanchez and anti-Catalan successionism and so on. So now. If Feijó is a chance to get rid of all of that, then you should rationally vote for Feijó. But that's kind of a too rational view of politics today and kind of ignoring that people do vote on emotional grounds, especially on the far right. Um, and that therefore, uh, there are many voters that would want to still vote emotional, even if that would damage the options of uh, ousting Sanchez and, and others from, from power. So. You know, the big question is, you know, when, when push comes to, to show what happened with, with Vox voters, do they vote for Vox as a, as, a, as a guarantee that the PP would stay right and therefore to turn it into a, a pure or a, or a real right wing uh, party, conservative party, or they suspect because they suspect that otherwise Fejo is too moderate, like, like, like Rajoy was also too moderate. So that's kind of the debate that they have in the in the, in the left. And let's see also how the Spanish public react because I always say that you know uh, Vox is not a Franco nostalgic party. Those who are nostalgic of Franco, of course, which is a very limited number, they will vote for Vox. But you cannot explain Vox uh, as a as a Franco nostalgic party. You can explain Vox Vox much better as any other radical right party around Europe these days with agendas which are gender, climate change, anti-wokism, and all these kind of things, right? So so it's it has some local elements and, and, and things, but it's kind of party that I think it's more in line what we see all across Scandinavia, uh, and uh, but also the Netherlands and many other parts of, uh, of Europe and Italy, of course. You know. Okay, um, good, good. And we have two uh, good questions in the chat. And, and one of them is concerning this question. You touched briefly upon uh, whether it was the, you know, the, and the electorate which has moved to the right or whether politicians have sort of moved to the left. You know, if you had to interpret or if you could even say if it's one or the other, how, how do you interpret the, the rise of, of, of the right wing in, in the polls and then at the regional elections uh, in terms yeah. of this question? Yeah, I would say that. Uh, more generally, uh, this is a country in which uh, typical uh, neoliberal or very conservative policies do not bode well, do not fare well in polls, for example, um, on uh, sexual freedom issues. Despite its kind of past, you know, as, a, as or precisely maybe because of that, that ultra nationalist Catholic past, Spain has done the full swing into moral issues in which we see attitudes. When you look at the World um, Values Survey, Spain is above France uh, and, and, of course, Italy and some other countries in terms to uh, appreciation of, uh, of, of sexual freedom and personal issues. And, uh, you know, Spain was a pioneer in legalizing same-sex marriage and all these kind of things, you know. So Spanish society has proved 
very resilient to hold on these freedoms. And every conservative government, even if they protested when they were in the opposition about some of these things, when they came to power, like abortion and other things, they would never change that. They would just, you know, swim with the with the current, you know. So on that, the country has not turned uh, right. We don't see a rising religion, a rising practice. We don't see demonstrations against abortion. It's true that the left, uh, and especially Unidas Podemos, has gone a bit too far on gender issues and especially and especially on on, on LGBTI stuff by inserting into the law the provision that you know you could you could choose your sex starting at 14. But you know the the, the conservatives were saying that they were willing to accept it was 16. So it's not that you know they were they were totally against this. You know the discussion was between whether it was you know 14, 18, and they might have settled in 16, right? Uh, yeah, so but uh, so so in those issues the, the conservatives. You know, I think it Vox is mostly uh, a reaction to uh, Catalonia uh, at the time at the time of the illegal uh, referendum in 2017 and the emotions that that burst out. You know, when you had a threat to the integrity of, of, of the country, then you have a mobilization at the other end of the spectrum. And then they've been, they've been effective in kind of colonizing some kind of uh, things which are around uh, in many other European countries. Um, and the US, you know, they had some support from Steve Bannon at the beginning and some kind of techniques of how to do politics on Twitter and all those kind of things. But I wouldn't say that um, Spain has uh, fully turned uh, to the right in, in that sense. Also, economically, uh, welfare state is not under question. Um, people still care about good uh, public health and good public education, pensions and so on. So you don't see this kind of... Uh, Republican Party uh, okay. Tea Party thing going to the right by saying, you know, mm-hmm. private pensions, private school, lowering taxes. I mean, not even Vox. I mean, Vox, they say they want to reduce the number of ministries, but you know that the savings with these are very limited. They're not advocating to reduce taxes, to reduce the size of the state or to reduce welfare, right? All right. All right. Um, we, we have to talk about uh, Europe and Spain's position in the EU. There's a, a presidency coming up, and we also have uh, one question about this in the chat. But before doing that, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned Catalonia, because that has, uh, of course, been a, a huge issue in Spanish politics uh, over the last decade. And you, you've already out- outlined how Spain has evolved from a, a two-party system to something like a four-party system now. And this is a new dynamic, which obviously is a new ri- reality to for everyone to adapt to. And I think in Denmark, we tend to forget that Spain's democracy is only uh, 45 years old, which makes it the youngest democracy in Western Europe. And in in, in the recent uh, years, it has stood against several challenges, one of which is Catalonia, as you mentioned. But also a couple of years ago, the, uh, in, the Economist Intelligence Unit downgraded Spain's democracy from a full democracy to, to a flawed democracy. Could you just briefly, before we go to the uh, to Europe and, and election themes and so on, tell us what's the state of the Spanish democracy now? And is that also part of the, the, the campaign and the, the thinking yeah. in this election? Yeah, well, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a political scientist. And I thought when I saw that um, uh, that grading by the Economist Intelligence Unit, I was wondering why is it that they didn't downgrade Britain uh, to, a, to a partial democracy because of the effect of the Brexit referendum you know, and which which showed uh, very clearly what was the quality of democracy and public debate and what happened afterwards and so on. You know, I think that there, but, um, and also, you know, as you see, you know, the United States has been going through very deep issues related with uh, with democracy and what has, you know, no institution has been, has allowed or dared to kind of downgrade uh, the U.S. substantially from, from that category, you know, but I don't, I don't want to, I mean, I, I don't think this is a justification. For anything wrong that is on those indexes, but I would I would do say that you know I, there is the VDEM or other indices which I think are a bit more balanced and less kind of Anglo-centric, um, in which you you would see Spain doing better than 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 the economies and there. So precisely also because sometimes there is kind of this legacy of uh, what I resist uh, uh, that is this kind of post post Franco Spain framework, you know that uh, you know at some point. 
it's true, you know, as you say, that Spanish democracy is a is is not the the oldest one. But you know, after forty five years, you're not either an infant, right, or an adolescent, right? So at some point, you know, I always say, uh, I remember back like Havel asking Bill Clinton, when were when did you stop being the former kind of colony of Britain? I say why? I say because I want to know when will I stop being the former Czechoslovakia? You know, so. <laughs> So at some point you will say, well, at some point, you know, our problems and the problems that we have in Spain, I think at this point are pretty standard and um, and are not necessarily related to post-Franco Spain. In, and with Catalonia, you would see that, in fact, you know, since the beginning of democracy, there was a party that it was in favor of, of, of succession in Catalonia and they ran for 24 elections, something like that, and they never got more than 8% of the vote. So it's not that this party was new or that this sentiment was not there or that it was uh, forbidden or banned and so on. You know, They were there from the beginning of transition to democracy, but they were not popular. They, they started being popular only in 2008, 2010 as a consequence of the financial crisis, as a consequence of austerity policies, and a consequence of the disruptions in governance in the region, which, um, which uh, led to severe cuts and corruption scandals and all that. And it was at that moment in which the Conservative Party in Catalonia, the, the, the nationalists, turned pro-succession. And then they jumped kind of in a wave and so on. But other than that, I think, um, you know, as, as you've seen, um, the uh, politics now in Catalonia is has been kind of been brought back into uh, into normal. Uh, most of the participants in that referendum agreed that there was a total mistake, as by the way, the Basque nationalists of uh, the radical wing did in, in the Basque country, that in order to have your country breaking from Spain, you will first break your own region in two. And this was kind of a crazy thing that they realized that it was a huge mistake in, in, in Catalonia, that you, you yeah. broke Catalonia in two in order to break from, from Spain. But, uh, yeah. but then in terms of, of democracy, I would say um, that at this point, most of the, of the problems uh, that we have are not related to Catalonia. I would say they are related to uh, the colonization of institutions by the main two political parties with the lack of independence of some institutions which are too party affiliated uh, and therefore change too much with every government. Yeah, in, a, in that way, I suppose you could also say that the four party system shows that it has it has become a more mature democracy, right? But let, let's turn to, uh, to, to the role of EU and, and Europe. So what role, if any, does the EU play in election debates? Are there any major disagreements between the parties? And then this uh, important question in the chat, would that affect the Spanish presidency uh, starting in two months of the EU? Yeah. Or how do you see okay. this? Uh, yeah. on, the, on the EU, you know, this is, um, you know, we could do another full hour on, on, on Spain and the EU, but, uh, you know, uh, and, and I know, you know that from Denmark, sometimes this is difficulty, difficult to see, you know, I was, I was 18 when I arrived to, to Denmark in 1986, uh, the year that Spain became member of the European Union. Uh, for uh, my parents' generation, uh, you know, membership to the EU was the dream. You know, so Spanish identity, democracy, and the EU are totally intertwined. Uh, they are, you know, like, a, and also Spanish identity and European identity are two sides of the same coin. We are a bit like Germany. You cannot be a good German if you are not a good European. In Spain, it's kind of the same. You know, you cannot be a good Spaniard if you're not a good European, because otherwise, then you look as a kind of a crazy ultra nationalist that will want to recreate um, problems uh, inherited from from the past. So, as in other countries, the EU is an existential issue which divides society in two. Our existential issue is below the EU; is is the nation itself. So, you know, in Denmark, when you discuss when you discuss Europe, you don't discuss the nation. Right, um, uh, the nation is not under dispute. It's the question of who interprets best or who wants the best for Denmark as a whole. In Spain, because we have issues related with territorial integrity, all parties see the EU as a guarantee for the future of the country, no matter whether you stay or whether you break away. If you break away, you will still want, want to be pro-Europe and European. So the most boring thing you can do in Spain is to watch a debate on the European elections where you will see seven parties basically saying the same things, 
even Vox, who at the beginning, they tried to do this kind of uh, Le Pen and uh, far right, anti-Europe, uh, pro-sovereign, they didn't find any traction for these because, you know, what are you going to do with the 75 billion next generation EU funds? Are you going to say, I'm a proud Spaniard and I don't take this money? Mm. Or do you want to go back to the peseta? Or, <laughs> but, but, but so, it, so it, it does not work that way, you know? But yeah, if I may, there must be some important differences on the specific topics and the important issues within the EU that, uh, you know, a, 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 an EU presidency would also have some influence on putting on the agenda. It could be, you know, uh, migration policies, agriculture, climate legislation. What, did, what do you think are the main points of difference between a, a left-wing government and a right-wing one? Basically, the, what is at stake for uh, for Spain's relations to, to, yeah. to the EU? I mean, I would, I would say that, uh, but as you see, you know, as, and as you know, uh, at the end, you know, the European Union is a coalition government of the center, the left and the right. And uh, and it's quite amazing that things which are under dispute sometimes in national politics, when you insert them into an EU discussion, you will see that the Spanish political parties tend to agree more in Brussels among themselves than they do on Thursday night when they come back to Spain. And it's basically the same policies. Of course, you know, you have marginal policy, marginal difference in some, some policies which are can be explained ideologically. You know, the conservatives would want more protection for farmers, even if it's at the cost of less environmental friendly policies. You know, they would they are more pro-business um, uh, when it comes to climate change and also energy transition. Uh, They're less pro-subsidies. They want, you know, to keep uh, salaries, uh, uh, you know, the minimum salary lower than, you know, what the left would say and so on. But I would say that, you know, the um, on migration, this is a very surprising country because with the exception of Vox, uh, which hasn't even been able to to turn migration into a campaign issue, uh, there is there is a lot of agreement into that. For the first, you know, like Vox, it's very nationalistic party. Most of our immigrants come from Latin America. So you cannot be anti-Latin Americans because they speak Spanish, they're part of your culture, and you claim that they are brother, right? So even if... For for all the reasons you would want less Latin Americans maybe in Spain, that's kind of the right thing for Vox to to say. And it's true, you know, even in cases of um, 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 trying to steer Islamophobia on the occasion of some of some Islamic uh, uh, driven or jihadist driven bombings and attacks, it hasn't worked for for Vox, you know, because our 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 immigrants coming from Morocco are well known are not uh, radicalized. Uh, they don't live in ghettos and they are, we don't have integration problems with the second or third uh, generation. So, you know, it's, has not, it's, it's been very difficult for Vox to, um, um, to put that on the agenda. Of course, they want less immigrants and, and, and they want to criminalize uh, immigrants, especially those who have, uh, don't have the right papers and so on. But this is something which the conservatives are not accepting, are not buying into. Um, so there are, you know, for all the, uh, the the toxicity and polarization that you see in Spanish politics, it's mostly about identity that is about politics. So we have what we call affective polarization, right? It's not policy-based polarization. Difference between parties on main issues, you can put them on a standard left-right axis, and then they will negotiate depending on that. It is this kind of emotional polarization. You know, I was just reading something by a Spanish colleague who is a chair in political science living in, 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 in Sweden. And he says his conclusion is that we never discussed so much about so little in Spain. <laughs> but that's kind of the trend of our times everywhere. OK, so if I get if I get your basic message right, this is, uh, of course, a very important election for Spain, but perhaps not so much for Europe and the, the Spanish presidency of the EU will not be affected to a large degree. Uh, will yeah, it be the a... only pity, yeah, the only pity is I think is that um, the conservatives and the socialists have not sat down to negotiate the goals of the presidency uh, because lots of bridges, you know, are broken and, and channels of dialogue are broken among them. But uh, but still, you know, I don't see a major disruption. Even having a change of government in the middle of the presidency, as it would have been the case in France, should you have, you know, have had a, 
Le Pen coming in and Macron leaving, it would be a total disruption for our presidency because clearly Marine Le Pen, you know, party should, you know, if 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 things go fast and well, uh, Congress will be convened on August 17th and you could have a government by the 1st of September if it's a conservative government. And they have a well proven repertoire of pro European policies that they will fall back into, right? So, uh, so I don't see them. Um, I mean, they will put some things outside of the agenda, but those who were the priorities maybe are the socialists, but not necessarily uh, items which are in the agenda, you know, because this is a golden presidency, it's the last before um, uh, the full before an election. There are 400 dossiers on the table that had to be closed. Uh, and this is a task which, uh, you know, the state secretary for the EU, the perm rep and everything are dealing with kind of in loyalty with the aid of the commission, the council and, and parliament. Lots of this stuff is on Trilog uh, at, at this point. So, so I don't see major disruption. What is going to be damaging for Spain is that we will not be able to put or to ride into the European Council conclusions if, it's, if we have a change of government things which would be important for us for Spain in the future, uh, especially for the next um, agenda in the in the EU. And there are issues which are key for Spain. I think Latin America is one, Mediterranean is another, but um, uh, fiscal rules is the other, reindustrialization, which, uh, and you know, economic protection, which cannot be only to protect Germany and France's economy, is another thing. So I see it, I see it more damaging for the Spanish long-term EU goals. Uh, we're not saying a lot on enlargement. We're not saying a lot on European defense at this point because of the electoral cycle. So I think I see it more damaging for ourselves than for Europe. Okay, we're nearing the end, but uh, we also got a late start because of some technical issues. So I know that you have five more minutes. Uh, so I we will continue minutes, yeah. also because we have um, questions in the chat. Uh, first of all, I mean, now we've talked about Europe and so on, but we haven't talked a lot about the election themes in the actual uh, Spanish debate. You say you, you have effective polar, polarization, right? And the disagreements may not uh, be so deep, but what are the questions that voters are most concerned about and what actually fills the, the newspaper headlines these days? Okay, I think there are there is one thing in which the socialists uh, two things on which the socialists want to capitalize. One is um, gender violence. This is the weakest spot of uh, the conservatives if they go in coalition with Vox, because uh, Vox denies the existence of gender violence. They call it intra-family violence. And this is, of course, in sheer contradiction with all international treaties, legislation, doctrine, uh, including Istanbul, you know, agreement and, and treaty and, and everything. So every time there is kind of a slightest uh, agreement or with uh, in a, any municipal town between PP and Vox, which includes the reference to these kind of issues or to sexual freedom in which uh, Vox is very conservative, this becomes uh, a, a nationwide debate and it's kind of a dot in the line which the socialists want to connect, saying the conservatives show up or try to pretend they are, they are moderates, but in fact, they will sacrifice women uh, for you know, being in government and they will accept these crazy things by, 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 by box. So this is a major campaign issue. And we see it almost every week uh, because Vox is very vocal into, into this. Sometimes, you know, it's kind of they represent uh, you know, they, they represent this kind of angry men on feminism party uh, that we see in, in, in many places. Then the other question is the economy. So that's, that's kind of the negative agenda. Uh, Vox is going to put this in danger. Then is the positive, the positive agenda for the socialist, the economy. Is the economy is doing, is doing well, let's try and turn back this to, even if you don't like Sanchez, even if you don't like his dealings with the Catalan and Basque nationalists, you know, don't be stupid. You know, uh, the conservatives do not have, have the time to put together a serious economic program. We don't know whether they go. I mean, of course, they say they're going to reduce debt, reduce taxes and increase public services. Right. So this doesn't fit. 
of course. Uh, so they want to highlight also these contradictions and say, look, you know, we've done well, Spain is doing well. Um, the question there is whether voters in the in the in the in the twenty in the lowest twenty percent uh, have benefited from all these measures of energy, you know, inflation containment and salary rises and so on. Because inflation, as we know, is devastating at the lower end of the spectrum. So so at the same time, some of the people has has benefited from this management are people who are not usually turning to vote. So, you know, you may do very well on the economic front, but some people are maybe alienated or will not participate in the vote. So you won't capitalize on that. So I think, you know, this kind of economic issues is of the right thing and um, and gender issues are, are dominant, are going to be dominant in the campaign. OK. One last question for the last two minutes, and it unfortunately has to be a, a very brief answer. You said before that uh, you worry that Spain is not might not be able to uh, assert its influence on what are Spain's you know, long term strategic interests within the EU. What are those interests? I mean, what how how would Spain like to um, to shape the EU? Yeah, well, as we already saw with um, Eastern enlargement. You know, to which extent the EU was moving east geographically. Uh, you can deal with that. The problem is to which extent it moves east also politically in terms of more intergovernmentalism uh, being the rule. Uh, when we joined in, in 1986, it was good to be pro-European, right? Now you seem to, you are in a minority when you raise your hands, I'm pro-Europe, and people say, no, no, we're coming here to work, not to make, you know, ideological statements on Europe and so on. So, and then I think Ukraine's war is going to have um, Europe, for very obvious reasons and very natural reasons, you know, looking at that area on a row for maybe the next 10 years with huge reconstruction efforts. In the case things go well, in the, in the in the case things go bad, it's even more attention to that area, and that has consolidated a block of countries, Scandinavian, Baltic, and Eastern, uh, whose views of Europe and integration process, and you know if you want federalism or not, intergovernmentalism are a bit far away. So in terms of integration process, that's key, and also geographically, it's true that we need more attention to be paid. To, to, to North Africa, Sahel and Africa. This is where the migration flows are gonna be coming from. No matter what we do, we and our migration policy that we are proving is just punitive. It doesn't have a progressive understanding of what's down there and how is it working and so on. And the same with Latin America, which is a region with 33 countries which share our values, uh, but we pay very little attention uh, to. All right, we could surely talk uh... <laughs> for another hour on this. Thank you so much for making us all uh, wise about uh, Spanish politics and the election. Mange tak. <laughs> Mange tak. And uh, we look forward to following it uh, the coming months. Uh, and thank okay. you for all the, the questions in the chat. Thank you. Thank you to all. Thank you to all. Bye bye.